Ghosts of Heathrow. You mind you don't get snagged on that fence? I'll be sure and... Oh, for the love of... Oh, it's not the prettiest greeting, I grant you. Nasty, but necessary. Gibbets. Gibbets. Well, I'm Barry, I'm the co-founder of the Ghost Minor Paranormal Society. And we're a professional paranormal investigation team that operate across the whole country. And what we want to do today, I think, is just establish the, air, the key areas of the places that have been, uh, you know, that people have experienced things in, um, and then we can work in those particular areas. They say it puts them ugly villains off their ugly deeds, but I see is no sign of it. This is disgusting. You can't leave corpses rotting in cages, no matter what they've done. I work here, yeah, I've done 29 years here on BA, and I drive the pilots around, I do the passengers as well, but I drive the pilots around, the crews, and they've actually told me, about six, seven pilots have actually told me they've seen a man in a black suit, bowler hat, umbrella and a briefcase walking down this runway here, this new runway here. So they've said to me, they think they've run someone over in their plane, and they've actually asked for the marshal sex to come out and check the runway. Why would they call the tower? Because the tower is saying to them, well, there's nothing on their radar. And the pilot's saying, well, I'm telling you, I've just run someone over. How do you bear it? How do I bear what? That! The planes! Don't you hear them? You're a strange one and no mistake. I'm a strange one. Ghosts of Heathrow by Sebastian Bachkiewicz. That night, that third night at the Premier Lodge Inn, Heathrow, surrounded by the ever-blinking rise and fall of jumbo jets, I enjoy a specifically sized burger in a specifically sized bun accompanied by just the right amount of fries and a carefully selected side serving of fresh green salad comforting this frequent flyer with all his creature comforts good evening everyone um, i hope you've enjoyed this second day of our excellent conference tonight's an opportunity to get to know one another and have a drink on dawson winters <laughs> special shout out to the team here at the hotel for their help so um thanks everyone and uh, enjoy enjoy and there we all are, all of us delegates, gathered, dutifully gathered, in our dress-down casuals, white shirts, blue jeans, enjoying the same size burger in the same size bun, heartily downing a man-sized lager at the plasterboard bar, and glad to be out of their air-conditioned room of regulated temperature, a room to which I, weary-eyed and flight-fatigued, am about to retire to, when? Can I join you? Uh, actually, I was just off to... Off to? Riveting speaker today, Rebecca. <laughs> Excellent. Man made the blinds look interesting. How are you, Martin? Good. I'm good. Tired. Not wearing your name badge, I see. It's pinned to my pyjamas. You want to be careful, those pins. Very nasty. Look, I really ought to be getting... Didn't think I'd see you. I mean, I hoped I would, but you didn't confirm. I checked. It was that last-minute thing, my boss. And here you are? Yes, here I am. A marketing conference in Heathrow. Hard to resist. I hoped you'd do it. After the last time, I missed you. Rebecca, this... What happened? You and I... I just wanted to see you, Martin. If that's wrong, then sorry. And she looks at me, this Rebecca. This woman with whom I spent a long ago night in another hotel. The twin of the one we sit in now looks at me. As if I broke a promise I never made. How are the kids? Your kids? Both good, thanks. I heard you got promoted. Congratulations. Thanks, yes, I was pleased. Of course it means more time away from home. It's good seeing you, Rebecca. Really? I'm in 315. One floor yes, down. It's late and I'm... All the time, then. 
Another time. We're good together, Martin. Rebecca. Don't you feel it? I think you feel it. You do feel it, don't you? I see it. Night, Rebecca. Sorry. Crossing the foyer, I wave a swift good night to the other delegates, too lost in chat to acknowledge my passing. As I, absorbed now into the lift, select floor four and swipe my card in the door of room 402, treating myself to a long hot bath, and finally settling myself down in a bed big enough to accommodate a family of five. And that night, that third night, I have the most wonderful dream. No, it's not a dream of confused, ambiguous vision, but more a sensation of serene well-being, like a balm from blue, blue heaven. And I think it's going to be a long, long time till touchdown brings me round again to find... Sir, can you repeat that? that? There are children on my corridor, running, running children. I'll look into that straight away, sir. But she couldn't be less interested. This shimmy, shiny receptionist, who seems to be far more concerned with the Japanese gentleman, who hovers beside me. Something will be done, though. You'll, you'll, you'll see to it. Uh, miss, 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 I'm talking to you. Absolutely, sir, straight away. And with that... The receptionist turns away to play a swift, light-fingered sonata on her keyboard, with me returning now to 402, exhausted, beyond exhausted, hoping that the dream of sweet well-being might somehow return, and I be made whole and hopeful once... Come away, my Oh, God. Will you just... What are you doing? Oopsie Daisy. Best you be on your best behaviour now, mister. No sudden shouts or whimpers. Understood? Who are you? Who indeed, friend? Who indeed? I'm not your friend. Are you not? Listen, I'll call the police. I will. The who? The police. The authorities. Eh, there ain't no constable would trouble himself with 16 string jack. Not if he knows what's good for him. 16 string? On account of the stockings. You see the ribbons? Direct from the dainty hand of Miss Polly Bailey herself, Empress of Milliners, Covent Garden. I'm shutting this door now. Well, that would not be perspicacious of you, friend. Not perspicacious at all. Follow. Excuse me? You, friend, are being afforded a rare opportunity. An opportunity that would see you set on the road to sweet and wondrous liberation. I'm not leaving this room. This is my room. Room 402. And you has been here too long. T I've been here three nights. Three nights. Three nights, mm. yes. Well, friend, this is your chance to liberate yourself from your imprisonment. A person could easily weary of these confining walls, I'd wager. I have no idea what you're talking... Do you not? Do you have no inkling? Are you something to do with the children? What children? R running on the corridor here. Oh, I don't stand no nonsense from the young me. Well, they do say I have fathered seventeen, but they are as wasted as spores on the wind, and of no particular consequence. These delegates... What about them? They'd be delegating what? A, 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 a conference on... on um, uh... And he has me there. This black-cloaked gentleman still pointing his antique pistol and doing his level best to intimidate the living hell out of me as I, for the life of me, have no recollection whatsoever of what it is I'm actually doing here, in the Premier Lodge Inn, with the constant rise and fall of those... You seem confused, friend. Don't be confused. Our business today could not be simpler. You may leave, and leave forever. Would you please leave me alone? It is not my custom to retreat in the face of an angry punter. I'm not an angry punter. I'm a frequent flyer. <laughs> Am I to understand that you was a bird? Because if you is a bird, then you are not one of exotic plumage, such as is found on, say, a parrot. A parrot? 
or the insolent parakeet. What do you want with me? Oh, then I had a sovereign for every time I heard that, friend. Well, a highwayman must have nerves of vibrant steel and a heart as hard as rock. He must be a blackguard of the very lowest order. The engaging pallor of his stockings notwithstanding. <laughs> hey! And along that corridor I run, my footfall dampened by the closely fitted carpet, not daring to take so much as one single glance backward. As I emerge out into the lobby, empty except for the team of paramedics and Rebecca. Rebecca? With that rude reception, it's not nearly so neat and shiny now as a stretcher is wheeled out towards a waiting ambulance. Its blue lights flashing brightly, oh, so very brightly, in that drizzle-stained forecourt as I, moving faster than I've done for years, run blindly across that rain-glittered car park, the tarmac dazzling as diamonds, in the harshness of the streetlight illuminating vehicles, parked as quiet and still as closely gathered tombs. And I, not daring to pause, make breathless headway, stumbling, desperately stumbling, into a muddy field, and find myself devoured by a puddle of fetid water. Oh, God. Everybody, everybody that's been over there say the same thing. It feels like there's people in the bushes watching you. There's a person that's meant to be beheaded that's in there. There's meant to be a pathway that Dick Turpin used to use as you go to the big hill over the Donkey Woods, where the tank is. Um, I've heard that people have seen him riding his horse over there as well. No, no, no. Yeah, you don't want to be afraid of that old nag, mate. Who are you? Who are you? I asked you first. And I asked you second. You live around here? I've done for years. Years and years. Name's Monday, as in Tuesday. <laughs> Is that your horse? A rare beauty in his youth. Then he's nothing to do with 16-string Jack. <laughs> he's not about, is he? Because if he's about, you and I must make haste. And no mistake, he's a villain of the very lowest order. Does he scare you? <laughs> You're a right buzzing meadow of questions, aren't you? Well, I'm just lost, wet, and very confused. I can see that. And I want to get back to the hotel. What hotel? That hotel there. The green lights. You know what you need? You need a drink. That's four in the morning. Four in the morning? So there we are. Mr. Monday and I, trudging our way across that scrubby field, with the first light of day bluing the landscape time was this was all forest and park but now the roads get wider the carriage is more plentiful and as for the ne'er-do-wells <laughs> well it's gone the dogs if you ask me it mind your way past them public thank you used to be wolves here too you know. i didn't know that do say they shot the last one in perry oaks perry oaks you acquainted with the area the heath or heath road only to visit I grew up in Bristol. Other end of the road, then. What? Look, I, I live in San Diego now. I'm in computers. Oh, San Diego when he's at home? It's a city in America. Were well, you a Yankee? No, I just lit. Oh. <laughs> you get all kinds of nasty mess out here, mate. Pub's just over here. I'm here for the marketing conference. Oh, yes. Yeah, we had to reconfigure our marketing campaign and... And that's what I'm here for. That's the conference I'm supposed to be attending. That's the conference I'm supposed to be attending right now. Oh, yes. Yes, I've got to get back to the hotel. Well, in that state... I can change when I get back. And 16 string, you don't want to mess with him because there's no messing. Not when it comes to highwaymen and footpads. Oh, you get some foolish ladies swooning over them silly penny romances. But when all's said and done, there's precious little romance to be found at the wrong end of a pistol. <laughs> Nearly there. Stop, stop. End of the alley. Sipson. Oh, wait, wait, stop. What? The sun. Where's the sun? In God's heaven. But it was rising. Five minutes ago it was rising. And now it's night again. How can it be night again? Look, I'm not saying one single word to you until I've got me a pint in my hand. So you can chatter your heart out here in all this mud or you're in a company. 
The choice is yours. But as I watch him pull his old black hood over his head and trace his way toward a fence, I think of San Diego and the house I have there with the two bedrooms set aside for the kids when they sleep over. And the front room I had an interior designer design, only to find myself feeling as if I live in someone else's home. You mind you don't get snagged on that fence? I'll be sure and... Oh, for the love of it. Uh, it's not the prettiest greeting, I grant you. Nasty, but necessary. Gibbets. Gibbets. They say it puts them ugly villains off their ugly deeds, but I see no sign of it. Jesus. Not for the likes of you to take the Lord's name in vain. Oh, this is disgusting. You can't leave corpses rotting in cages, no matter what they've done. It stretches all the way to London town. Past eyes are worth even. Not that I've ventured. How do you bear it? How do I bear what? That, the planes. Don't you hear them? You're a strange one and no mistake. I'm a strange one. There are moments in one's life when it feels as if all ties are cut and one is suddenly as alone as alone can be with only a whistling man to lead you who knows where. It's a bit funny to sort of say really, it was just a presence and not a nice presence that you'd feel. You'd feel like something's, you know, over your shoulder. Um, whispers sort of in your ear but no one would be there I couldn't even understand what they would be saying to be honest, it was just like Shh, and then you'd look and then they'd be gone Isn't this a better proposition all round? A pint in one's hand and the cheer of good company no highwayman allowed not in here <laughs> your very good health you and I need to talk. You and I is talking. How's your pint? I flew in from San Diego three nights ago. You flew in? Yes, I flew in. On the wings of butterflies, I've no doubt. Oh, please stop being mad. Not me talking about flying. Now, just let me finish, please. Sixteen Strings said I had an opportunity to leave. What did he mean, leave? Oh, you don't want to go listening to him. He said I was confined. But you're not confined now. And here we two are, all safe and snug. Pint of warm ale in our hands. I don't feel safe and snug. You will, in time. What is happening to me? Are we not friends, you and I? Chums? Look, I live in San Diego. I head up a research section. I have two kids. Two kids, yes. Harry and Pearl. And they live with their mother. Their mother, Laurie. Laurie? Laurie, yes. We're divorced. We have been for years. Like Henry VIII. No, not like Henry VIII. Like me, Martin. My name is Martin. Pleased to meet you, Martin, I'm sure. EVP recording number one. We're in the bar area. We're on the booking recording now. These shadows here. How oh, that? You get used to that. Them. Them. Any second now, they'll start talking to us. An inconvenience, I call it. Calling upon any spirit persons that are here with us. If there are any, any spirits, any ghosts that would like to communicate with us, please can you come forward and give us a sign that you're listening? How is it that these shadows talk? Us two gentlemen living in a world of mystery, no? If there are any spirits here with us, please can you say hello? Who's he talking to? Me. They do this every so often. Well, this has happened before. You and the questions. Did you used to live here in this building? Did you drink in this pub? Aren't you going to answer him? Not today. If there is a spirit person here, can you please come forward and make the lights change on this K2 meter? Make it flash. It won't harm you. He's calling you a spirit. Why is he calling you a spirit? Well, lost him. Are you a ghost? Ah, do I look like a ghost? Are they looking for ghosts? These shadows. How do I know what they're doing? They're looking for ghosts. That's what they're doing. 
if there is a gentleman that sits in this corner and you've, you're not happy about that because I understand you are knock some drinks off the table, <laughs> can you tell us why you're unhappy? My name's Phil. I'm not being disrespectful to you, but could you tell us your name? You know there's no such thing, don't you? Then why are these talking shadows, then? I don't know, do I? There is a spirit person here with us, and you are able to communicate with us using this machine. Please, tell us your story. Speak to us. Do you have a message for somebody? <laughs> Robert, your name. <laughs> Anyone called Robert here? Martin, my name's Martin. Well, that's just worth to make sure we look down on it. Jesus. Green. Robert Green. Is your name Robert? Robert Jesus Green. No, my name is... It doesn't matter what my name is. I need help. Assistance. The police. Are we speaking to Jim? Police. Yes, the police. Is that you? Call the police. Is your name Jim? Is that you and the police no, called did, recently? Did someone get them? Are you the one who comes to see me now and again and smokes his pipe? I know you do. And two weeks ago, you stood outside my door. I've never been in this pub before. There's no getting through to them, I'm telling you. I know you come to see me because I've heard you. And somebody, somebody smokes tobacco or pipe tobacco. Uh, but I'm here. I'm standing right here. Like I said, no getting through to them. They'll be on their way soon. Hey, you haven't touched your pine. I'm not thirsty. I know you're friendly, because you don't cry to me. <laughs> that is it. Where, where are you off to? I'm off to the Premier Lodge Inn. Room 402, where I sleep. <laughs> I wouldn't go running off. <laughs> the heath can be scary, can be perilous. You sit a while longer, stay. But I don't want to stay with you. No, wait, wait! <sighs> but get out of there, I do. And out onto the hay-strewn street, the chippets still swinging up above me. And there, in the deep distance, what appears to be a street light, but faint and indistinct as if now the property of another world, another time. And to tell you the absolute truth, I'm feeling more than a little sorry for myself as I make my awkward way along another muddy track toward the light of a huge bonfire, burning, tiger bright in the distance, and the constant rise and fall of these great plains. And I think it's going to be a long, long time till touchdown brings me home. And here, now, sitting close by the bonfire, amongst the makeshift huts and the occasionally fractured glass of a dilapidated greenhouse, now converted into a place as near to home as it can possibly be, I feel myself to be in the presence of voices. It's like, in a way, it's been asleep, but in a way, it's been shouting as well, mm. and then no one's been hearing it, mm. and so then it's been screaming. I find myself... And then yeah, like listening. The, there will be trees growing on that runway before we know it, and now we get we get. Really and all the while, the sun still uh, arcs strangely in that deadening sky. And sometimes it feels like night. And sometimes day. And I think back to Rebecca, and those green uniformed paramedics in the lobby of the hotel. And I wonder who it was on that stretcher. And I hear her, as she says... I, I just went to his room to check, to see he was okay. We'd spoken earlier in the restaurant, and he said that he was tired, but that was all. Just tired. You didn't complain of feeling unwell? But remembering her, here beside the comfort of this bonfire, this woman I once upon a time made love to, our liaison as much a secret to ourselves as it was to the rest of the world. That's all he said. He said he was tired and wanted to get a good night's sleep. Recalling these memories now, I suddenly experience all the heavy strain of living. 
and living as well as one can within the fragile circumstance of the lives we try so very hard to organize and regulate, recede. And my heart aches roundly as I picture Laurie and Harry and Pearl as they were that summer day beside the family pool. And all the children swimming in the heat of that wonderful Californian afternoon. And I think of myself swimming peacefully in a stream when I was still a child. And there were streams then, streams that a boy and his mates could swim in. But where those streams might be now is anybody's guess. Oh, not again. What do you want? You children, what? But I'm in no mind to chase them. For here, by the fire, with the loom of that great hotel in the distance, I see the shapes of those I knew emerge before me from the fire. My mom, my dad, my sister, old friends, colleagues. Nari, Harry and Pearl. The flames assuming and consuming their shapes in its constant snap, crackle and pop. Until... Martin. Rebecca. You're right. It's been a long night for you, no? Oh, you're telling me it has. Oh, don't worry. I've got tomorrow's presentation prepared. I just need to plug in the PowerPoint and away we... You look tired, Martin. But I'm supposed to be speaking today. You know I am. Oh, dead, Martin. It's no simpler way to say it. I'm what? Three years. Are you dead, too? No. Well, then how can you and I be... They're all waiting for you in your grandmother's house, Martin. Who? Your mom, dad. Everyone. Waiting for me where? Perry Oaks. Where's Perry Oaks? That's for you to discover. How am I supposed to do that? Everyone's really excited to see you. They want you home. And you can't really want to haunt that dreary old hotel room anymore. It's just not right, Martin. You know it's not. That's what Sixteen String Jack said. He said I had an opportunity to leave. But I just got here. I, I, I flew in three nights ago with you. And died peacefully in your sleep. But I saw you in the lobby. You were right there tonight. I saw you. The body on the stretcher. That was the night you died, my love. That body was you. What? You're lying, Rebecca. And why would I do that? Uh, but, because I disappointed you. I know I disappointed you, but you and the others can't persecute me like this. I won't be persecuted, I won't. Look, see? Dead people don't feel the cold. Dead people don't feel the wet, and dead people don't... Well, whatever it is dead people are supposed to do, I don't do them. Now, if it's all the same to you... Where are you going? Over these fields. Back to 402, my room, where I'm happy. You'll never be happy in room 402. Not unless you get to Perry Oaks. But I'm not interested in anything else she has to say. As I trudge out, looking for a way back to the comfort of 402, my sanctuary, and my safety. But the path is gone. With the moon making icebergs of the hangars, lowering in the still of that ever-shifting sky. Right, what happened was, is we was working in Armsworth. There was only three of us that night. There was me, you, and Pinky. So I said to Josh, there's a black bloke up on the mezzanine floor, didn't I? He did. And he said, there's no one up there, Bob. I said, Josh, I'm telling you now, there's someone up there. So he went round to the office, and Pinky was sitting there logging stuff in, wasn't he? Right, yeah. So I said, have we got an agency bloke tonight? And he said, no. I said, well, how comes two pallets from the mezzanine floor which were at the back, have moved to the middle. And what happened after that? I've gone upstairs. There's two pallets which I've put up there to the back. I'd say four or five hours later, uh, in the middle of the mezzanine floor. You can't explain it. I can't explain it. Mr Pink would never leave his office because he's a chubby guy and he's not going to walk around the office. So, who As moved? a supervisor, I said to him, did you move that pallet? And he swore. On his mum and dad's lives, he didn't move that pallet. So I said, but I, I'm not the one to turn around and say, hold on, that's a ghost. But what else can explain it? The way I look at it is, if I can't see it, I don't believe it. Yeah, exactly but that. The thing, what what plays on your mind is, is I Who mean, done it? It, exactly. how did it happen? Yeah. 
And for the first time tonight, in the presence of these portly plains, slumbering in the hollow of their hangers, I'm suddenly aware of the sheer, bewildering loneliness of this place, as if stranded on a planet inhabited by a singular inhabitant. And that inhabitant was... Hello there. Me. Were you on the flight too? No. Jeffrey Springley. Pleased to meet you. You're not here for the conference. At the Premier Lodge Inn. I'm trying to get back there. I have a room. My room. Not acquainted. Sorry. Is it new? It's been there for years. Hope you don't mind me saying so, but you seem to be in a bit of a tiz, old chum. My... Uh, an old friend just told me I was dead. Do you get that too? Annoying, isn't it? It's happened to you? Usually mother. Sometimes Frank. Sometimes they come once or twice a night, but I assure them I'm not going anywhere. Not without my briefcase. What's in it? Papers. Confidential papers. Pan Am. Pan Am? You wouldn't have a shifty, would you? What do they say to you? Your mum, Frank. Oh, the usual. That I'm dead. Lost. Total tosh, of course. That's what I said. Still, they can be awfully persistent, can't they? It's brown with black straps. The briefcase. I, I think I might have dropped it. Oh, you can't go out there. That's the runway. But there's no stopping Jeffrey Springley. Seriously, it's not safe. Oh, I think I can manage. But there's a plane landing. Don't be silly. I'm not being silly. There's a plane coming into land. You're beginning to sound like my mother. Come. But Jeffrey does not look out. Jeffrey does nothing but study the tarmac for some sign of his long-lost briefcase as the wheel of the plane passes straight through him. Are you all right? What? The plane, the plane. You look like you've seen a ghost, old boy. Did you not see it? See what? The plane, the plane that just ran you flat. Wasn't a Dakota, was it? I travelled in on a Dakota. Come with me. Come with you? Come with you where? Away from here, the runway. Frank put you out of this, didn't he? Honestly, I know a place we can both go. Perry Oaks. That's a sewage works. You know it. You're looking right at it. Edge of the field. That's Terminal 5. Well, I'm definitely not going to any sewage plant. Is, is that it? The briefcase, I, I, I think that's it. There's nothing there, Jeffrey. Only a runway and a plane. A landing plane. Look. Oh, for goodness sake, man. Get a hold of yourself. Jeffrey. What? Perhaps they're right. Perhaps we are what they say we are. They say we're ghosts. And ghosts, old oh fruit, do not exist. You've not been at the Scotch, have you? Seriously, Jeffrey, I'm sure that if you came with me, we could put an end to this. Sorry, old chum. No can do. But there's no listening to me, as Jeffrey, bowler hat held fast against his balding head, strides out toward a briefcase he will never find. His being stuck fast in a perpetual present he has no perception of. Like a fly bound in infinite marmalade and I leave him deciding in that instant that the only place for me to go is Terminal 5 and all is as it ever was no sign of anyone I may have had the misfortune or fortune to meet tonight only the ever-changing faces of the hastily passing passengers. A woman with a patterned purple cushion, a man wearing three hats, dressed for the beach, an elderly couple, well-to-do, her hair styled by thatches of London, a wave of his brolly, and away they go. And there are the doors which shush, the taxis that wait, the armed police, guns at rest across their bulletproof vests, as all around them the softly spoken sounds of hello and goodbye 
swirl all about us. And where am I? Where am I in all of this? A dead man, apparently, searching for a way out of the mess I'm in. And there, in the crowd, wheeling a trolley behind her. Rebecca. Definitely Rebecca. Her hair a slightly lighter shade. And behind her, clutching a little mermaid lunchbox, her daughter, no more than three or four. And I running now, running toward them, knowing that they cannot see me, know me, touch me. And I want to say, Rebecca. But before I do, she turns around, and to my complete astonishment says, Martin? Martin? For the briefest moment, I wonder if she sees me, actually sees me, even after all that has passed. But her daughter moves happily past her and disappears deeper into the terminal as I wave the wave of an old friend or a distant relative. And as they disappear, the terminal itself begins to fall away. And sprinting past me, those children again, those running children, no longer playing tag in a hotel corridor. And as they run, they run through orchards, verdant orchards. And there, where the policemen stood, are the carts and wagons, groaning with fruit and veg. And there are the farmers, leaning on the walls, pints in hand, whiling away an hour or so. And where not minutes ago the departure lounge stood, there is now a field of waving wheat and wild flowers. You again, Jack? Come to intimidate me, because you must know that I'm in no Stand mood. Stand aside. I have no time to tarry. What? You see him, I suppose? See who? That snivelling worm hiding behind that bush yonder. That's Mr. Monday. Monday, you villain! Oh, please, Jack. I have the coin you asked for. All of it. See? Oh, you're not going to shoot him. I shall shoot him and wear his gizzards as a neckerchief. Oh, you can't do this. Oh, please, Jack. Please. No! He's dead. You've shot him. And we'll do again. Night after night for all eternity. And was Mr. Monday offered an opportunity? An opportunity to leave? Chose to spend his time drinking warm ale in a damp pub, didn't he, the blackguard? And trapped me with him. Trapped? Rough justice, I know, but... One must suppose when all's said and done, I had it coming. The cruel consequence of a life of infamy. Well, then you shoot him night after night? For all eternity. And while he waits to be shot, he sits drinking in the pub? Mm. Gathering any stranger fool enough to join him. But you liberated yourself from his company, did you not? Rebecca said come to Perry Oaks. She said that I would be free there. Then my advice, go. Go there now. I never glanced back. I feel I should thank you for warning me. Away there, Nessa! Away! But before another word can be exchanged, the highwayman rides wearily away across the fields, into that deep wooded distance. And in the very root and fibre of my soul, I know I must take his advice and leave this place, leave it now. But there, at the end of a wooded path, I see my room. My room. Room 402. Bed, freshly made. Magazines and hotel information arranged neatly, oh, so very neatly, and so invitingly on the desk, that I want to run there. I want to run there and hide there, hide there forever. Lovely day, Martin. The sun. Glorious. Rebecca! You're here. I wondered. I just saw you get on a plane. How did I just see you get on a plane? No nonsense now, the truth. That Rebecca gets on a plane... This Rebecca, the Rebecca you knew, the Rebecca you ran from, the Rebecca in your head, well, here I am. You're in my head. Is that your hotel room? It's cosy, doesn't it? Safe. And I want to go back there. Go back there? Honestly, Martin, you can't say we haven't tried. You really can't. But I'm scared. And here's your chance to change that. But it's your call. Always was. I won't end up like Mr. Monday and Sixteen String Jack. I know, I won't. But don't you see, dear Martin, the second you choose to go back to room 402, 
you already have. Time for we two to say goodbye. You're not going to leave me. Leave you? Why I was never here, was I? Now, don't forget, they're all waiting for you at Perry Oaks. All the family. And with that, she's gone. This Rebecca. This woman with whom I spent a long ago night in a hotel room. The twin of the one I've been haunting for years. And all the time, I'm thinking of Geoffrey Springley and Mr. Monday assassinated right before my eyes. And as I think these things, I see a house. A house in the middle of this impossible field. I see Nana's house. And up above me is the great sun, rising. And there, the blue, blue sky. And all around me, in a great, unwieldy procession, I see the highwaymen, the smugglers, the coachmen, the landlords, the punters, the passengers, the always present passengers, and in amongst them the zeal of Roman helmets as they march among blue-skinned barbarians. And now there are faces from even deeper back, uplifted faces, the faces of sun worshippers gathered on the raised bank at Heathrow. And I hear their songs. Their chance to a sun, a sun of boundless wonder, a sun which illuminates me now as I begin to run toward the house, no matter how impossible it may be, and find my hand knocking cautiously on that green door, my nana's green door, and there they all are, gathered around an old kitchen table. Mum, Dad, my sister Louise, and half glimpsed. Almost indistinct, but definitely present. Laurie, my ex-wife, Laurie, beautiful Laurie, long-limbed and skin as soft and warm as heaven, and our kids, Harry and Pearl, playing peacefully together. And there's Rebecca and her daughter making their way through the terminal. And there are the delegates in their dress-down casuals. And arriving now is every person I ever knew, and ever cared for, and all those that I loved, and all those that I lost, are passing me by in this, the instant, the magical instant, that I, at long, long last, accept the simple fact of my death. With the children running, and the wheat fields waving, and the great sun rising. Rising, rising. Martin was played by Paul McGann. Rebecca by Susanna Harker, Sixteen String Jack by Joe Armstrong, Mr. Monday by Dudley Sutton, and Jeffrey Springley by Kevin Harvey. The vocal score was by Phil Minton, with sound design by Eloise Whitmore. Ghosts of Heathrow was written by Sebastian Bachkiewicz. It was produced by Joby Waldman in a Something Else production for BBC Radio Four. <laughs>